Well, welcome back, everybody. It has been a weird couple of weeks, at least for us, with travel, and then last week with the blizzard that happened here in Colorado. It sounds like more snow on the way tonight. Yay. Um, but we're back to normal, at least for this morning. I'm happy to see you here today. Happy for those watching online. Thank you especially to DJ covering for me last week, preaching so clearly, so thoroughly, um, the second chapter of 1 John for us. So I really hope that you watch. That is certainly a, a really beneficial thing for our church. So thank you, DJ, for doing that. And somehow you guys got off the hook. That was the week that I was supposed to be out of town. You were supposed to do church here without me, and you didn't have to. Uh, I'll make sure to get out of town some other time and give you that chance again because I want you to have that experience. I want you to run with the training wheels off for one Sunday. So that'll happen soon enough. But for now, hopefully through all of this, you remember that we are currently teaching through the New Testament letter of 1 John in our series that is called Overcome. And it occurred to me as I was preparing this week that in the first couple of weeks through this series, I never actually explained why it is titled Overcome. I've titled this series Overcome for a couple of reasons. First of all, the word overcome actually appears five times in the short letter of 1 John. So it's an important concept for the book. That's more than it occurs in any other book of the Bible. But even more than that, I think the, over, the word overcome actually conveys a lot of what this book is about. And the word overcome, I think, can be understood in two senses. The first sense that we understand the word overcome is for someone to overcome something. It is an act that someone overcomes. And what we see in the Bible is when the, when the word overcome is used by John in the Gospel of John, so not in the letter of 1 John, 2 John, or 3 John, but when he uses it in the Gospel of John, <clears throat> it's always in reference to Jesus. Jesus has, as he says, overcome the world. Jesus is the light that has come into the world, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the overcomer. He is the victor. He is the one who has achieved victory over Satan, darkness, evil, sin, and death. That's the first sense of the word overcome is used by John. Jesus has overcome. He has prospered. He is victorious. Jesus is the overcomer. But there's a second sense of the word overcome, I think, in our understanding. We sometimes think of being overcome as in we are the object of the overcoming, right? Sometimes we might think of ourselves as being overcome with emotion. We are overwhelmed with something like joy or sadness. And when we're consumed by a certain feeling, we might describe ourselves as feeling overcome. A change has happened from somewhere outside of us that dictates what we think and feel and how we act. And when we are overcome, we are dramatically affected by something that is outside of ourselves. <clears throat> now, that second sense, I believe, is truest to how John uses the word overcome in this letter of 1 John. See, every occurrence of the word overcome in 1 John is in reference to believers. The believers are the ones who overcome the evil one. What John is describing throughout this letter is the effect that knowing and following Jesus has on believers. So in chapter 1, John emphasized, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the transcendent reality of Jesus, that while he himself and many others had seen and touched and heard and known Jesus personally, that this Jesus was more than that. For people who had never touched or heard or seen Jesus, they could know this Jesus as well because he's not just a person. He is a transcendent reality that they can know. And then in chapter 2, as DJ taught last week, we saw John emphasizing the change that takes place as people put their faith in this transcendent Christ and repent of their sin. As we do, we overcome the evil one. As we follow the overcoming Christ, we then overcome the evil one alongside him. In other words, believers are people who are overcome by the overcomer himself. <clears throat> We are so entirely and overwhelmingly changed by Jesus that there are persistent and tangible changes in our lives as a result. Because Jesus has won the ultimate victory and overcome the darkness, we walk alongside him in the light, living as co-overcomers with him. So does this make sense? Jesus is the overcomer. We are overcome by him, and then we walk with him in his overcoming of evil, sin, and death. 
today as we cover chapter 3 of the book of 1 John, I believe that we'll see this argument from John begin to take even more shape. John's desire is for people to become overcome by the overcomer, to be fully and entirely changed by the goodness of Jesus. So let's dive in this morning. 1 John chapter 3, <clears throat> reading verses 1 to 3. It says this. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. <clears throat> and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Think on that first verse for just a moment. It's a great one to even memorize as a family. In fact, I would encourage you maybe to do that this week as you sit down to do your family devotion with your kids. This verse is part of our devotion this week. So you can memorize this verse and say, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The word that we translate as see is maybe even better translated as behold, saying look upon this greatness of what God has done in this love that he has shown to us. He has called us children of God. God through Jesus the Overcomer, has given us this great and incredible love, a love that accomplishes something unbelievable. The love that God has shown to us through Christ makes us his children. We are adopted into God's family. We are grafted into himself. We are redeemed and reunited with our creator. What sin has broken and severed, Jesus has restored. Now, that little part after that first verse that says, and so we are, so um, what love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are, that little part there, is generally believed to be an addition that was made by scribes as they copied this book over and over again for it to be distributed in the early church. So I kind of imagine that as if these devoted scribes, these believers who were committed to compiling the Bible and helping to replicate it and show it to other people to spread the good news of Jesus, I can imagine them writing this down and saying, see what kind of love the Father has shown to us that we should be called children of God. And then they just can't contain themselves anymore, and it's as if they just had to stand up and shout, amen, and so we are. This is the excitement and the joy that should come to us when we think about this idea that God has loved us so much that he has called us his children. Just as the scribes could not contain themselves and had to write this extra little part to say, and so we are, we also should share in that joy. I believe that we can be overcome with joy when we read a verse that says that we are made children of an eternal and powerful God. In fact, I believe kind of the guiding idea for this whole chapter is this. If you're following along with the blanks on your sheet, the blank is this. That by God's love displayed through Christ, we are adopted into his family. We are adopted into the family of God. Now this kind of family identification is important and carries a lot of meaning. Although I'm afraid that family identification and bloodlines and that kind of thing has been a little bit lost in our modern culture. E either way, the family to whom we belong for most of human history has been a deeply meaningful identifier for people. It's the whole reason that we have things like family surnames, some of which are cooler than others. I am very proud to be a funk of the funk line. That name has gotten me far in life. There are other things that, that are important to our family identification. It's the reasons we have things like some, some of you may have seen in the past a family crest, a symbol of your family lineage, right? Or it's the reason that we used to do things that I kind of wish we did more often, at least in my family, where we would have family reunions and you would connect with people that you hardly ever see from all over the place, getting together to say, the one thing we have in common is this family that we belong to. Family identification has, historically at least, provided a framework for understanding who we are. Our heritage matters. It helps us to define and understand who we come from, what we stand for, what qualities should be emulated, and maybe even some characteristics that should be avoided. Our family identification often gives us a sense of security and safety and a sense of being anchored. One good example for our understanding this morning might actually be 
a movie that I've never seen before, but I'm aware of, uh, the movie The Godfather. You guys know this movie? Pretty old, pretty well known. The Godfather is all about family, right? If there's anything that that movie makes clear is that once you're in the family of the, if you're in the family, then you're one of them, right? You belong, you achieve security, you have protection, you are in, you are loyal. There's a bond that's not easily broken, at least a bond that's not broken without, in that movie, what I believe to be very serious consequences for those who break the bond, the bond of family, right? And this is an idea that I think that we can cling to as we read this passage. By God's love displayed in Christ, we are adopted into his family. We have a new family identification. Our surnames are overshadowed by the name that is above all names. What we have thought to be our family crest is replaced with the cross. Our earthly bloodline is covered now by the blood of Jesus. In Christ, we have a completely new family. Now, the New Testament echoes this idea often. The passage we read from Ephesians this morning as we began our service today echoes this idea and uses very similar language. It says this in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. It says, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Or consider the well-known passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We cling to these truths. We cling to this hope. We are adopted as children of God. We have a new family identification now, new protections, security, assurance, guidance, and so much more. We no longer belong to our broken, sinful world. We instead belong to and with the Father. The gospel redefines who we are and whose we are. So look back at those opening lines from 1 John chapter 3 again. It says in verses 1 to 3, The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. The world to which you once belonged shouldn't even recognize you anymore if you are in Christ. You are no longer a part of that family. When we repent of our sins and put our faith in the finished work of Christ, we are made to be God's children. God then initiates a change in us. We are fully purified and justified by Jesus in eternity, but we are also in a process called sanctification as we grow and develop into this new family identity. Like DJ said really well in his sermon from last week, the goal is not that we suddenly become perfect. It's not, the goal is not holy perfection. It is holy direction. We are going somewhere. We are moving towards Christ-likeness. We are not exactly like him yet, but when he appears, we shall be made like him fully, as the verse just told us. So what does this new family identification look like for us? Well, let's continue on in chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. It says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. We are adopted into a new family as new creations with an entirely new nature. This is the change that God has initiated in us. The idea here is that before we were identified by or consumed by, overwhelmed by our own sinfulness. But Jesus appeared in order to take away sins, as the verse said, to change our nature, to overcome our sin. In him there is no sin. And as we see him and know him, we are identified and overcome by him. Sinfulness then becomes counter to who we are. In other words, because we're adopted into this new family, sinfulness goes against our very character. 
That's the first new identifier that we see as we understand what it means to be in the family of God. The next blank on your sheet is this. In this new family, we are given new character. God has initiated a change in us that makes us different than we were before. He's leading us to something, and that something is away from sin and towards righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 11. It puts it like this, saying, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Sinfulness is who we were before our adoption, but it isn't who we are now. We are adopted into his holy family, given a new heart and a new nature. We are free from the infection of sin. We consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Or consider 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In this passage, which is a little bit longer, you can read it on your own in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul lists out all sorts of sins from different lifestyles, different choices, different places that people were coming from. He talks about sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, theft, drunkenness, swindling, lying, all those different sorts of things. And this is what he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. He says, And such were some of you, but... You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Sinfulness is who you were, but in Christ, this is now who you are. In this new family of God that we are adopted into, we have a new character. Which is why John goes on to describe further in 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 to 10, he says this. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So with a right understanding of our adoption into a new family and our being given a new character and a new nature, it is only reasonable for us to have natural expectations for what that change should be like. We have a new identification, a new character, a new family. A person, as the verse explained, a person that's made righteous by God, who has truly encountered Christ and converted, should, in many ways, more and more, continually be appearing as righteous. They should no longer be conforming to the patterns of this world, but instead they should be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. On the other hand, someone who claims to follow Jesus, who claims to know the transcendent reality of Christ, but remains in sin or someone who even tries to justify their sin, those people are revealing the truth. They are not who they claim to be. They are not actually in the family. They still cling to the old ways of sin. They still live, as the verse says, as loyal children of their father, the devil. If we are born of God, adopted into his family, and given this new nature, this new character, then it only makes sense for us to seek righteousness, to seek what pleases God, it should become more and more the most natural thing for us to do. We are becoming dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, let me pause for just a moment and acknowledge the sort of cultural moment that we find ourselves to be in. There seems to be a pretty widespread misunderstanding of this concept for many people that are outside of the church. Many people see Christians like us as judgmental moralists that simply want to impose our moral opinions on everybody else. A lot of people say, and I've even heard this on the news this week, that if Christians would just love people the way Jesus loved people, then we wouldn't be so hung up on other people's sin. This is a gross misunderstanding. Now, I will say, there may be some truth to this idea that Maybe Christians could do a little bit better about not holding non-Christians to Christian standards. 
as we understand this verse, we are living in different families. People outside of the church, people who do not know Christ, who are not living and abiding in him, we cannot expect them to live to the Christian moral standard of character. That is not who they are. They live in a different family. They come from a different family line, the line of the devil. They are consumed and overcome by sin. But we, as Christians, should have the expectation for one another that we are holding ourselves to a high moral standard because that is who we are characterized to be by our new family. So for Christians, this is our fundamental understanding. As we approach this kind of cultural pressure, we have to cling tightly and explain this well. The love of Jesus that they say that we should claim above sin, that love is inextricably linked to repentance. You cannot have the love of Jesus. You cannot show the love of Jesus without leading people to repentance and turning away from their sin. Living as a son or daughter of God means identifying with righteousness and following his commands. It isn't our opinion it is in our interpretation of the Bible. It is our character. It is how he has remade us and adopted us into his family. It is who we are. We are changed by God. Our desire should be to seek what pleases him. And of course, as I explained a few weeks ago, as we see the truth of our sin, we're compelled to lead others away from their sin and towards Jesus. The love of Jesus always leads us towards repentance, and showing others that love absolutely involves leading them away from their sin, not affirming it. We recognize sin for what it is, a killer, part of who we used to be, the result of the lies of our former father, the devil. We have been given new life and have been adopted by our new father. And we simply cannot walk in that sin any longer. In our new family, we are given new character. And as we share the goodness of Jesus with other people, we have to be able to lead them in honesty to the truth that their sin is hurting them and killing them. But Jesus has offered us a new way and a new family that changes our character so that we no longer have that taste for sin that we used to have. As the Bible Knowledge Commentary puts this, this is a really great quote that I read this week. It says, when a Christian sins, he conceals who he really is rather than making it manifest. We lean on this truth that God changes us. When he adopts us into his family, he changes our character. And when we choose to sin, we are covering up the trueness of our character, that we are made one with God through Christ. <clears throat> we are, in our deepest parts of our hearts, dead to sin alive to God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> now, John goes on to show us more of what this new family means for us in verses 11 to 15. Look with me. It says this. <clears throat> for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. <clears throat> Some pretty strong language used there, right? And again, we see this distinctiveness. Before we were adopted into the family of God, we were like Cain. We were like murderers because we were unrighteous in our sin. But through Christ, we are made to be more like Abel, more righteous. Now, for that reason, we should not be surprised, as the verse said, we should not be surprised when the world hates us. The world is sinful and unrighteous and of its father, the devil. That world is at odds with who we are. We are in conflict with a sin-infected world. It is counter to our new nature and our new character. But here in this passage, John takes a turn and shows us one of the more practical results of our newness. He says that the biggest distinctives of our new family identity that we have is love for our brothers. A central quality that comes with our adoption in this new family is that in this new family, <coughs> we experience 
new care. That's the next blank on your sheet. In this new family, we experience new care. Now, if you were with us online or in person um, for our previous series, which was called One Anothering, we covered this idea in great detail. Again, the usage of the words one another here or the brothers here is about other believing Christians within your local church. There is a distinctiveness that comes as we are adopted into the, the big family of God. We are also adopted into a small local family of other believers. And in that local family, we should experience extraordinary care. You may have even heard me say sometimes I might refer to us as the Aspen Grove family. That is what we are pushing for. That's what we seek to be. We are adopted by the same father, you and I, into the same family. And as a result, we should exercise extraordinary levels of family-like care for one another. <clears throat> In the same way that I would hope that you can count on your actual family to be there for you when you are sick or hurting or in need, your local church should be all of that and much more. You are adopted into a family that is characterized by extraordinary care. <clears throat> John describes it even further in the following verses, saying in verses 16 through 18, he says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. We know a new and better kind of love in Christ. That means that the love that we share with one another is his love. And that should be in very tangible and practical ways, a love that outshines any other imitation love that the world has to offer. We have a new loving kind of care in our new family of God. We ought not to simply talk about these ideas, but we must act them out. We cannot love, as the verse says, in word or talk, but we must love in deed and in truth. Now, finally, John finishes out this section of his letter in 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 to 24, saying this, By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. Beloved, if, your heart does, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases God. Him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Once again, our adoption into God's family should be evident in the way that we live. In the deepest parts of our hearts, we have this assurance that we are a part of his family. When our hearts condemn us, as the verse says, which basically means when the Holy Spirit convicts us, when we feel the Holy Spirit revealing sin in our lives, we have this comfort knowing that God is greater than our hearts, that he has overcome that sin, that it is no longer our nature. When we are tempted, we are not bound to that temptation. We are not bound to sin. We are made new and freed from sin by Christ. We are not condemned even by the sinful desires that may remain in our hearts. Jesus leads us away from sin and towards righteousness. And as part of his new family, we are drawn into obedience to command, to his commands, and we should seek what pleases him. More than anyone else in our lives, we are to seek to do what pleases the Father who has adopted us. It is our highest priority, which leads me to the last aspect of our adoption. As we are adopted by God in this new family, we also have a new cause. We have a new direction. <clears throat> we have a new purpose, a new reason for living, a compelling and undeniable cause. And what is this new command? What is this new cause? What is this new thing that we are supposed to follow and do? 
John answers in verse 23. You'll see it. It says, our cause is that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and that we love one another. Wholehearted belief and faith in Jesus is our goal. We are to seek him, to know him, to follow him, and to glorify him. And as we do, we are to love one another actively together, participating in the mission of the local church. We are this family of faith for a reason, where we are for a reason. This is our cause, our purpose, our reason for existing. We are adopted into the family of God, and now we live for his family to continue to be expanded as more and more people hear the good news of Jesus Christ and find their adoption in him. That is what we are for. We have a great cause and mission before us as a church. So as we finish up for this morning, I want you to understand this. You, as an individual, are invited into the family of faith. God is extending the offer for you to be adopted into his family. And through the work of Jesus Christ, God has made a way for you to be renewed and adopted, for you to be freed from your sin. He will create in you a new heart, give you a new character, rescue you from the sin that rules you before, and put you into his family. Repent of your sins and turn to Jesus in faith today. And when you do, you will be adopted into his family. And not only that, but I do want everyone to understand that if you are a believer who has placed your faith in Jesus Christ and repented of your sins, if you are adopted into the family of God, then you are also invited into the family of the local church. I want you to be a part of what we call Aspen Grove Church, where we will together persistently offer extraordinary care for one another as we live for the cause of Christ. We're adopted into a new family, and in that family we have a new character. We're given extraordinary care, and we have a cause that is worthy. Let's honor God with our lives. Let's pray together as we finish for today. <clears throat> God, we cannot thank you enough for adopting us into your family. Let us, like the scribes, jump up and shout for joy, saying that because of the great love shown to us by the Father, we are made children of God, and so we are. Let that not be lost on us this morning. But God, as members of this new family, we pray that you will continue 